This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by David Barnes, London, June 2006. The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson. Chapters 4 to 7. Chapter 4. The Carew Murder Case. Nearly a year later, in the month of October, 18-something, London was startled by a crime of singular ferocity, and rendered all the more notable by the high position of the victim. The details were few and startling. A maidservant living alone in a house not far from the river had gone upstairs to bed about eleven. Although a fog rolled over the city in the small hours, the early part of the night was cloudless, and the lane which the maid's window overlooked was brilliantly lit by the full moon. It seems she was romantically given, for she sat down upon her box, which stood immediately under the window, and fell into a dream of musing. Never, she used to say with streaming tears when she narrated the experience, never had she felt more at peace with all men, or thought more kindly of the world. And as she so sat, she became aware of an aged and beautiful gentleman, with white hair, drawing near along the lane, and advancing to meet him, another and very small gentleman, to whom at first she paid less attention, when they had come within speech, which was just under the maid's eyes, the older man bowed, and accosted the other with a very pretty manner of politeness. It did not seem as if the subject of his address were of great importance. Indeed, from his pointing, it sometimes appeared as if he were only inquiring his way. But the moon shone on his face as he spoke, and the girl was pleased to watch it, it seemed to breathe such an innocent and old-world kindness of disposition, yet with something high, too, as of a well-founded self-content. Presently her eye wandered to the other, and she was surprised to recognize in him a certain Mr. Hyde, who had once visited her master, and for whom she had conceived a dislike. He had in his hand a heavy cane, with which he was trifling. But he answered never a word, and seemed to listen with an ill-contained impatience. Then all of a sudden he broke out in a great flame of anger, stamping with his foot, brandishing the cane, and carrying on, as the maid described it, like a madman. The old gentleman took a step back, with the air of one very much surprised and a trifle hurt and at that Mr. Hyde broke out of all bounds, and clubbed him to the earth. And next moment, with ape-like fury, he was trampling his victim underfoot, and hailing down a storm of blows, under which the bones were audibly shattered, and the body jumped upon the roadway. At the horror of these sights and sounds, the maid fainted, it was two o'clock when she came to herself and called for the police. The murderer was gone long ago, but there lay his victim in the middle of the lane, incredibly mangled. The stick with which the deed had been done, although it was of some rare and very tough and heavy wood, had broken in the middle under the stress of this insensate cruelty, and one splintered half had rolled in the neighbouring gutter, the other, without doubt, had been carried away by the murderer. A purse and a gold watch were found upon the victim, but no cards or papers, except a sealed and stamped envelope, which he had been probably carrying to the post, and which bore the name and address of Mr. Utterson. This was brought to the lawyer the next morning, before he was out of bed, and he had no sooner seen it, and been told the circumstances,
than he shot out a solemn lip. "'I shall say nothing till I have seen the body,' said he. "'This may be very serious. Have the kindness to wait while I dress.' And with the same grave countenance he hurried through his breakfast and drove to the police station, whither the body had been carried. As soon as he came into the cell he nodded. "'Yes,' said he, "'I recognize him. I am sorry to say that this is Sir Danvers Carew.' "'Good God, sir!' exclaimed the officer. "'Is it possible?' And the next moment his eye lighted up with professional ambition. "'This will make a deal of noise,' he said. "'And perhaps you can help us to the man.' And he briefly narrated what the maid had seen, and showed the broken stick. Mr. Utterson had already quailed at the name of Hyde, but when the stick was laid before him he could doubt no longer— Broken and battered as it was, he recognized it for one that he had himself presented many years before to Henry Jekyll. "'Is this Mr. Hyde a person of small stature?' he inquired. "'Particularly small and particularly wicked-looking is what the maid calls him,' said the officer. Mr. Utterson reflected, and then, raising his head, "'If you will come with me in my cab,' he said, I think I can take you to his house. It was by this time about nine in the morning, and the first fog of the season. A great chocolate-coloured pall lowered over heaven, but the wind was continually charging and routing these embattled vapours, so that as the cab crawled from street to street, Mr. Utterson beheld a marvellous number of degrees and hues of twilight for here it would be dark like the back end of evening, and there would be a glow of a rich lurid brown, like the light of some strange conflagration, and here, for a moment, the fog would be quite broken up, and a haggard shaft of daylight would glance in between the swirling wreaths. The dismal quarter of Soho, seen under these changing glimpses, with its muddy ways and slatternly passengers, and its lamps, which had never been extinguished, or had been kindled afresh to combat this mournful reinvasion of darkness, seemed, in the lawyer's eyes, like a district of some city in a nightmare. The thoughts of his mind, besides, were of the gloomiest dye, and when he glanced at the companion of his drive, he was conscious of some touch of that terror of the law and the law's officers, which may at times assail the most honest. As the cab drew up before the address indicated, the fog lifted a little and showed him a dingy street, a gin palace, a low French eating-house, a shop for the retail of penny numbers and twopenny salads many ragged children huddled in the doorways, and many women of many different nationalities passing out key in hand to have a morning glass, and the next moment the fog settled down again upon that part, as brown as umber, and cut him off from his blackguardly surroundings. This was the home of Henry Jekyll's favourite, of a man who was heir to a quarter of a million sterling. An ivory-faced and silvery-haired old woman opened the door. She had an evil face, smoothed by hypocrisy, but her manners were excellent. Yes, she said, this was Mr. Hyde's, but he was not at home. He had been in that night very late, but had gone away again in less than an hour. There was nothing strange in that. His habits were very irregular, and he was often absent. For instance, it was nearly two months since she had seen him till yesterday. "'Very well, then. We wish to see his rooms,' said the lawyer. And when the woman began to declare it was impossible, "'I had better tell you who this person is,' he added. "'This is Inspector Newcomen of Scotland Yard.' A flash of odious joy appeared upon the woman's face. "'Ah!' said she. "'He's in trouble. What has he done?' Mr. Utterson and the inspector exchanged glances. "'He don't seem a very popular character,' observed the latter. "'And now, my good woman, just let me and this gentleman have a look about us.' 
in the whole extent of the house, which but for the old woman remained otherwise empty, Mr. Hyde had only used a couple of rooms, but these were furnished with luxury and good taste. A closet was filled with wine, the plate was of silver, the napery excellent, a good picture hung upon the walls, a gift, as Utterson supposed, from Henry Jekyll, who was much of a connoisseur, and the carpets were of many plies and agreeable in colour. At this moment, however, the rooms bore every mark of having been recently and hurriedly ransacked. Clothes lay about the floor, with their pockets inside out. Lockfast drawers stood open, and on the hearth there lay a pile of grey ashes, as though many papers had been burned. From these embers the inspector disinterred the butt-end of a green cheque-book, which had resisted the action of the fire. The other half of the stick was found behind the door, and as this clinched his suspicions, the officer declared himself delighted. A visit to the bank, where several thousand pounds were found to be lying to the murderer's credit, completed his gratification. "'You may depend on it, sir,' he told Mr. Utterson. I have him in my hand. He must have lost his head, or he would never have left the stick, or, above all, burned the cheque-book. Why, money's life to the man. We have nothing to do but wait for him at the bank, and get out the handbills. This last, however, was not so easy of accomplishment, for Mr. Hyde had numbered few familiars. Even the master of the servant-maid had only seen him twice, his family could nowhere be traced, he had never been photographed, and the few who could describe him differed widely, as common observers will. Only on one point were they agreed, and that was the haunting sense of unexpressed deformity with which the fugitive impressed his beholders. CHAPTER Five, INCIDENT OF THE LETTER it was late in the afternoon when Mr. Utterson found his way to Dr. Jekyll's door, where he was at once admitted by Paul, and carried down by the kitchen offices and across a yard, which had once been a garden, to the building which was indifferently known as the laboratory, or the dissecting rooms. The doctor had bought the house from the heirs of a celebrated surgeon, and his own tastes being rather chemical than anatomical, had changed the destination of the block at the bottom of the garden. It was the first time that the lawyer had been received in that part of his friend's quarters, and he eyed the dingy windowless structure with curiosity, and gazed round with a distasteful sense of strangeness as he crossed the theatre, once crowded with eager students and now lying gaunt and silent, the tables laden with chemical apparatus, the floor strewn with crates and littered with packing-straw, and the light falling dimly through the foggy cupola. At the further end a flight of stairs mounted to a door covered with red bays, and through this Mr. Utterson was at last received into the doctor's cabinet. It was a large room, fitted round with glass presses, furnished, among other things, with a cheval-glass and a business-table and looking out upon the court by three dusty windows barred with iron. The fire burned in the grate, a lamp was set lighted on the chimney-shelf, for even in the houses the fog began to lie thickly, and there, close up to the warmth, sat Dr. Jekyll, looking deadly sick. He did not rise to meet his visitor, but held out a cold hand, and bade him welcome in a changed voice. "'And now,' said Mr. Utterson, as soon as Paul had left them, "'you have heard the news?' The doctor shuddered. "'They were crying it in the square,' he said. "'I heard them in my dining-room.' "'One word,' said the lawyer. "'Carew was my client, but so are you, and I want to know what I am doing.' "'You have not been mad enough to hide this fellow.' "'Utterson, I swear to God,' 
cried the doctor, I swear to God I will never set eyes on him again. I bind my honour to you that I am done with him in this world. It is all at an end, and indeed he does not want my help. You do not know him as I do. He is safe, he is quite safe. Mark my words, he will never more be heard of. The lawyer listened gloomily. He did not like his friend's feverish manner. "'You seem pretty sure of him,' he said. "'And for your sake, I hope you may be right. "'If it came to a trial, your name might appear.' "'I am quite sure of him,' replied Jekyll. "'I have grounds for certainty that I cannot share with any one. "'But there is one thing of which you may advise me. "'I have... I have received a letter, and I am at a loss whether I should show it to the police. I should like to leave it in your hands, Utterson. You would judge wisely, I am sure. I have so great a trust in you. You fear, I suppose, that it might lead to his detection? asked the lawyer. No, said the other. I cannot say that I care what becomes of Hyde. I am quite done with him. I was thinking of my own character which this hateful business has rather exposed. Utterson ruminated a while. He was surprised at his friend's selfishness, and yet relieved by it. Well, said he at last, let me see the letter. The letter was written in an old upright hand, and signed Edward Hyde, and it signified, briefly enough, that the writer's benefactor, Dr. Jekyll, whom he had long so unworthily repaid for a thousand generosities, need labour under no alarm for his safety, as he had means of escape on which he placed a sure dependence. The lawyer liked this letter well enough. It put a better colour on the intimacy than he had looked for, and he blamed himself for some of his past suspicions. "'Have you the envelope?' he asked. I burned it, replied Jekyll, before I thought what I was about, but it bore no postmark. The note was handed in. Shall I keep this and sleep upon it? asked Utterson. I wish you to judge for me entirely, was the reply. I have lost confidence in myself. Well, I shall consider, returned the lawyer. And now one word more. It was Hyde who dictated the terms in your will about that disappearance. The doctor seemed seized with a qualm of faintness. He shut his mouth tight and nodded. I knew it, said Utterson. He meant to murder you. You have had a fine escape. I have had what is far more to the purpose, returned the doctor solemnly. I have had a lesson. Oh, God, Utterson, what a lesson I have had! and he covered his face for a moment with his hands. On his way out, the lawyer stopped and had a word or two with Paul. "'By the by,' said he, "'there was a letter handed in to-day. What was the messenger like?' But Paul was positive nothing had come except by post, and only circulars by that, he added. This news sent off the visitor with his fears renewed. Plainly the letter had come by the laboratory door. Possibly, indeed, it had been written in the cabinet. And if that were so, it must be differently judged, and handled with the more caution. The newsboys, as he went, were crying themselves hoarse along the footways. Special edition! Shocking murder of an MP! That was the funeral oration of one friend and client— and he could not help a certain apprehension, lest the good name of another should be sucked down in the eddy of the scandal. It was, at least, a ticklish decision that he had to make, and self-reliant as he was by habit, he began to cherish a longing for advice. It was not to be had directly, but perhaps, he thought, it might be fished for. Presently after, he sat on one side of his own hearth, with Mr. Guest, his head clerk, upon the other, and midway between, at a nicely calculated distance from the fire, a bottle of a particular old wine, 
that had long dwelt unsunned in the foundations of his house. The fog still slept on the wing above the drowned city, where the lamps glimmered like carbuncles, and through the muffle and smother of these fallen clouds the procession of the town's life was still rolling in through the great arteries, with a sound as of a mighty wind. But the room was gay with firelight. In the bottle the acids were long ago resolved. The imperial dye had softened with time, as the colour grows richer in stained windows, and the glow of hot autumn afternoons on hillside vineyards was ready to be set free and to disperse the fogs of London. Insensibly the lawyer melted. There was no man from whom he kept fewer secrets than Mr. Guest, and he was not always sure that he kept as many as he meant. Guest had often been on business to the doctors. He knew Paul. He could scarcely have failed to hear of Mr. Hyde's familiarity about the house. He might draw conclusions. Was it not as well, then, that he should see a letter which put that mystery to rights? And above all, since Guest, being a great student and critic of handwriting, would consider the step natural and obliging. The clerk, besides, was a man of counsel. He would scarce read so strange a document without dropping a remark, and by that remark Mr. Utterson might shape his future course. "'This is a sad business about Sir Danvers,' he said. "'Yes, sir, indeed. It has elicited a great deal of public feeling,' returned Guest. "'The man, of course, was mad.' "'I should like to hear your views on that,' replied Utterson. "'I have a document here in his handwriting. It is between ourselves, for I scarce knew what to do about it. It is an ugly business at the best.' "'But there it is, quite in your way, a murderer's autograph.' Guest's eyes brightened, and he sat down at once and studied it with passion. "'No, sir,' he said, "'not mad. But it is an odd hand.' "'And by all accounts a very odd writer,' added the lawyer. Just then the servant entered with a note. "'Is that from Dr. Jekyll, sir?' inquired the clerk. I thought I knew the writing. Anything private, Mr. Utterson? Only an invitation to dinner. Why, do you want to see it? One moment. I thank you, sir. And the clerk laid the two sheets of paper alongside, and sedulously compared their contents. Thank you, sir, he said at last, returning both. It's a very interesting autograph. There was a pause during which Mr. Utterson struggled with himself. "'Why did you compare them, Guest?' he inquired suddenly. "'Well, sir,' returned the clerk, "'there's a rather singular resemblance. The two hands are in many points identical, only differently sloped.' "'Rather quaint,' said Utterson. "'It is, as you say, rather quaint,' returned Guest. "'I wouldn't speak of this note, you know,' said the master. "'No, sir,' said the clerk, "'I understand.' But no sooner was Mr. Utterson alone that night than he locked the note into his safe, where it reposed from that time forward. "'What,' he thought, "'Henry Jekyll forge for a murderer!' And his blood ran cold in his veins." Chapter 6. Remarkable Incident of Dr. Lanyon Time ran on. Thousands of pounds were offered in reward, for the death of Sir Danvers was resented as a public injury. But Mr. Hyde had disappeared out of the ken of the police as though he had never existed. Much of his past was unearthed, indeed, and all disreputable. Tales came out of the man's cruelty, at once so callous and violent, of his vile life, of his strange associates, of the hatred that seemed to have surrounded his career, but of his present whereabouts not a whisper. 
From the time he had left the house in Soho on the morning of the murder, he was simply blotted out, and gradually, as time drew on, Mr. Utterson began to recover from the hotness of his alarm, and to grow more at quiet with himself. The death of Sir Danvers was, to his way of thinking, more than paid for by the disappearance of Mr. Hyde. Now that that evil influence had been withdrawn, a new life began for Dr. Jekyll. He came out of his seclusion, renewed relations with his friends, became once more their familiar guest and entertainer, and whilst he had always been known for charities, he was now no less distinguished for religion. He was busy, he was much in the open air, he did good, his face seemed to open and brighten, as if with an inward consciousness of service, and for more than two months the doctor was at peace. On the 8th of January, Utterson had dined at the doctor's with a small party. Lanyon had been there, and the face of the host had looked from one to the other, as in the old days when the trio were inseparable friends. On the 12th, and again on the 14th, the door was shut against the lawyer. The doctor was confined to the house, Paul said, and saw no one. On the 15th he tried again, and was again refused, and having now been used for the last two months to see his friend almost daily, he found this return of solitude to weigh upon his spirits. The fifth night he had in guest to dine with him, and the sixth he betook himself to Dr. Lanyon's. There at least he was not denied admittance, but when he came in he was shocked at the change which had taken place in the doctor's appearance. He had his death warrant written legibly upon his face. The rosy man had grown pale. His flesh had fallen away. He was visibly bolder and older. And yet it was not so much these tokens of a swift physical decay that arrested the lawyer's notice, as a look in the eye and quality of manner that seemed to testify to some deep-seated terror of the mind. It was unlikely that the doctor should fear death, and yet that was what Utterson was tempted to suspect. Yes, he thought, he is a doctor, he must know his own state, and that his days are counted, and the knowledge is more than he can bear. And yet when Utterson remarked on his ill looks, it was with an air of great firmness that Lanyon declared himself a doomed man. "'I have had a shock,' he said, "'and I shall never recover. It is a question of weeks. Well, life has been pleasant. I liked it. Yes, sir, I used to like it. I sometimes think if we knew all we should be more glad to get away.' "'Jekyll is ill, too,' observed Utterson. Have you seen him? But Lanyon's face changed, and he held up a trembling hand. I wish to see or hear no more of Dr. Jekyll, he said in a loud, unsteady voice. I am quite done with that person, and I beg that you will spare me any allusion to one whom I regard as dead. Tut, tut, said Mr. Utterson, and then after a considerable pause, can't I do anything, he inquired. We are three very old friends, Lanyon. We shall not live to make others. Nothing can be done, returned Lanyon. Ask himself. He will not see me, said the doctor. I am not surprised at that, was the reply. Some day, Utterson, after I am dead, you may perhaps come to learn the right and wrong of this. I cannot tell you. And in the meantime, if you can sit and talk with me of other things, for God's sake, stay and do so. But if you cannot keep clear of this accursed topic, then, in God's name, go, for I cannot bear it. As soon as he got home, Utterson sat down and wrote to Jekyll, complaining of his exclusion from the house and asking the cause of this unhappy break with Lanyon and the next day brought him a long answer, often very pathetically worded, and sometimes darkly mysterious in drift. 
the quarrel with Lanyon was incurable. I do not blame our old friend, Jekyll wrote, but I share his view that we must never meet. I mean from henceforth to lead a life of extreme seclusion. You must not be surprised, nor must you doubt my friendship, if my door is often shut even to you. You must suffer me to go my own dark way. I have brought on myself a punishment and a danger that I cannot name. If I am the chief of sinners, I am the chief of sufferers also. I could not think that this earth contained a place for sufferings and terrors so unmanning. And you can do but one thing, Utterson, to lighten this destiny, and that is to respect my silence. Utterson was amazed. The dark influence of Hyde had been withdrawn. The doctor had returned to his old tasks and amities. A week ago the prospect had smiled with every promise of a cheerful and an honoured age. And now in a moment friendship and peace of mind and the whole tenor of his life were wrecked. So great and unprepared a change pointed to madness— but in view of Lanyon's manner and words, there must lie for it some deeper ground. A week afterwards Dr. Lanyon took to his bed, and in something less than a fortnight he was dead. The night after the funeral, at which he had been sadly affected, Utterson locked the door of his business room, and sitting there by the light of a melancholy candle, drew out and set before him an envelope addressed by the hand and sealed with the seal of his dear friend. Private, for the hands of J. G. Utterson alone, and in case of his predecease, to be destroyed unread. So it was emphatically superscribed, and the lawyer dreaded to behold the contents. I have buried one friend to-day, he thought. What if this should cost me another? And then he condemned the fear as a disloyalty, and broke the seal. Within there was another enclosure, likewise sealed, and marked upon the cover as, Not to be opened till the death or disappearance of Dr. Henry Jekyll. Utterson could not trust his eyes. Yes, it was disappearance, here again, as in the mad will, which he had long ago restored to its author, here again were the idea of a disappearance, and the name of Henry Jekyll, bracketed. But in the will, that idea had sprung from the sinister suggestion of the man Hyde. It was set there with a purpose all too plain and horrible. Written by the hand of Lanyon, what could it mean? A great curiosity came on the trustee to disregard the prohibition and dive at once to the bottom of these mysteries. But professional honour and faith to his dead friend were stringent obligations, and the packet slept in the inmost corner of his private safe. It is one thing to mortify curiosity, another to conquer it and it may be doubted if, from that day forth, Utterson desired the society of his surviving friend with the same eagerness. He thought of him kindly, but his thoughts were disquieted and fearful. He went to call indeed, but he was perhaps relieved to be denied admittance. Perhaps in his heart he preferred to speak with Paul upon the doorstep, and surrounded by the air and sounds of the open city, rather than to be admitted into that house of voluntary bondage, and to sit and speak with its inscrutable recluse. Paul had, indeed, no very pleasant news to communicate. The doctor, it appeared, now more than ever confined himself to the cabinet over the laboratory, where he would sometimes even sleep. He was out of spirits, he had grown very silent. He did not read. It seemed as if he had something on his mind. Utterson became so used to the unvarying character of these reports that he fell off little by little in the frequency of his visits.
Chapter 7 Incident at the Window It chanced on Sunday, when Mr. Utterson was on his usual walk with Mr. Enfield, that their way lay once again through the by-street, and that when they came in front of the door, both stopped to gaze at it. Well, said Enfield, that story's at an end at least. We shall never see more of Mr. Hyde. I hope not, said Utterson. Did I ever tell you that I once saw him, and shared your feeling of repulsion? It was impossible to do the one without the other, returned Enfield. And by the way, what an ass you must have thought me, not to know that this was a back way to Dr. Jekyll's. It was partly your own fault that I found out, even when I did. So you found it out, did you, said Utterson. But if that be so, we may step into the court and take a look at the windows. To tell you the truth, I am uneasy about poor Jekyll, and even outside I feel as if the presence of a friend might do him good. The court was very cool and a little damp, and full of premature twilight, although the sky, high up overhead, was still bright with sunset. The middle one of the three windows was halfway open, and sitting close beside it, taking the air with an infinite sadness of mien, like some disconsolate prisoner, Utterson saw Dr. Jekyll. "'What, Jekyll!' he cried. "'I trust you are better.' "'I am very low, Utterson,' replied the doctor drearily. "'Very low. It will not last long, thank God.' "'You stay too much indoors,' said the lawyer. "'You should be out, whipping up the circulation like Mr. Enfield and me. Uh, "'This is my cousin, Mr. Enfield, Dr. Jekyll. "'Come now, get your hat, and take a quick turn with us.' "'You are very good,' sighed the other. "'I should like to very much. "'But no, 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 it is quite impossible. "'I dare not. "'But indeed, Utterson, I am very glad to see you. "'This is really a great pleasure.' I would ask you and Mr. Enfield up, but the place is really not fit. Why, then, said the lawyer, good-naturedly, the best thing we can do is to stay down here and speak with you from where we are. That is just what I was about to venture to propose, returned the doctor with a smile. But the words were hardly uttered before the smile was struck out of his face and succeeded by an expression of such abject terror and despair, as froze the very blood of the two gentlemen below. They saw it but for a glimpse, for the window was instantly thrust down, but that glimpse had been sufficient, and they turned and left the court without a word. In silence, too, they traversed the by-street, and it was not until they had come into a neighbouring thoroughfare, where even upon a Sunday there were still some stirrings of life, that Mr. Utterson at last turned and looked at his companion. They were both pale, and there was an answering horror in their eyes. "'God forgive us! God forgive us!' said Mr. Utterson. But Mr. Enfield only nodded his head very seriously, and walked on once more in silence. End of chapter 7